What's going on, guys? Welcome to Hostile Q&A. And the first thing I want to say is I apologize for this taking so long to get up. We posted the questions, I think, a week ago, or maybe more. And uh, I have been busy doing labeling and doing T-shirts and trying to get the business set up and doing videos on my own YouTube channel that I really apologize that we didn't. I just It's my fault. I just didn't get to this in time. This won't happen again the next time we do a Q&A. I promise you the video will be up the day after the questions go up at least. So uh, I just want to start off by saying I apologize for the late uh, response to these questions, but I hope I can answer as many as possible and uh, it'll make up for the time delay that has occurred. So in the meantime, I'm going to set up my clock here for one hour. I'm going to answer an hour worth of questions. And hopefully that will get through most of them. There's something like 140 questions here. So I hope to get as many as I can. I'm just going to kind of go through and try and pick out the ones I think are more important. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys will get some benefit out of it. As far as the hostile line goes, pre-orders are going to start after the Arnold Classic. We are targeting March 11th as the day for pre-orders. I'm not going to say it's for sure. Don't quote me on that, but we're targeting that day as the day that a new website will launch and you can start ordering there uh, for your the new hostile supplements that will be shipped hopefully the first week of April. So anyway, without further ado, I got the clock set for one hour. And we're going to start from Lawrence BL. Will you have a booth at the Arnold? Will the supplements be out by then? Uh, we really, really wanted to. It just the production date for our supplements is, I believe, March fifteenth, the week of that week. So we just kind of missed the Arnold Classic by a little bit. I think even if we were out before that, it would have been too much to take on. Uh, the very first, you know, it's such an early start to our company. So I think the Arnold Classic next year is a target for us. I love the Arnold Classic. It's a show I've been going to in Ohio since you know, I was 20 years old. So, you know, 20 years ago was the first time I went and I usually try and go every year, even just to walk around the expo and see people and say hi to people and all that. And, um, I hope to be back next year as a vendor. So, or who knows, maybe a competitor and a vendor, we'll see what happens. But yeah, this year it, it's just, it's too soon for us. Uh, I am JTM says, what's your, what sets your supplement brand apart from the hundreds of others out there? Well, I'm going to start by saying this. Not all supplements are equal. Not all ingredients are equal. Not all brands are equal in their service and their care for their product. And that's across the board. You know, saying there are hundreds of other supplement companies out there, what separates yours? is kind of like saying there are hundreds of different automobiles. What separates them? Well, what separates them is just your taste, your flavor, your... Your, what do you like better? Does it fit you better? Do you like the style of that car better? Do you like the way it runs better? Is it more reliable? Is it tested more? Like they, it it's kind of seems funny to me that we are in a market where for some reason people think, well, there should only be 10 of 10 supplement companies and having too many doesn't make sense. More is better. More means more competition. More competition means a better product for the consumer. So now to answer your question, this is what I believe sets us apart. One, it's coming from me being a bodybuilder uh, and I know what I like and I know what works for me. And I'm not a numbers guy, I'm not a business guy, I'm a bodybuilder. So one of the advantages I feel that we have is I'm not in this to take this product and say, okay, I can make this for a dollar, let's sell it for a hundred and then I make a $99 profit and I don't care if it works, if it doesn't work, I don't really give a shit. I just want to make a $99 profit. That's what a, that's what a numbers guy does. As a bodybuilder, my main focus is not numbers. Obviously, I want to make money. Obviously, it's a business. But my main focus is not numbers. My main focus is I want to make sure the product goes out and it works. Okay? I want to make sure the dosing is done properly. I want to make sure the ingredients are sourced properly. I want to make sure we're putting doses in the, in the formula that are the most the body can handle and get a benefit from and aren't going to make anybody sick. Um, 
those are the main things you're going to look for. When you look at ingredients, a lot of people don't, part of our job as a new supplement company, I believe is learning to educate or sorry, trying to educate the consumer. I feel like the education of the consumer sometimes falls partly on them, but it falls partly on the, on the brands and marketing usually is how can I get the most out of the customer and do the least to get it. That's usually how marketing works. I'm going to try and tell these people that this is way isolate, even though 85% of it is way concentrate, but legally I can say it's way isolate because there's some way isolate in it. So it's kind of a job of a marketer traditionally to trick the customer into buying something that it's not, that's actually cheaper than what they're buying. And that's not what we want to do. We're going to say, we don't know what those other guys are doing. All we know is this is the most you can put in this product for this ingredient and this ingredient and this ingredient. And this is where the claims are. This is where the scientific studies are. They're not at 500 milligrams. If you have 500 milligrams of X ingredient, that's not where the claims are for that ingredient. So if someone says, if someone says citrulline is great for pumps, but they only have two grams of citrulline in their product. Actually, they can't really say that because your claims have to be backed by some type of study or science. And pumps for cit from citrulline are mainly based on six grams per uh, dose. So this is what we did is we looked at all the ingredients. We looked at where the studies are. We looked at where all the claims were, like where, where did these benefits for these ingredients come from at what dose we did that then we tried to source a high quality of ingredient because not all ingredients are equal beta alanine a generic beta alanine is not going to be the same as uh, beta alanine in a branded form of carnison which we don't even use beta alanine because i don't i'm not actually a fan of it there's we have a better ingredient for you anyway but i'm just using that as an example because generic beta alanine costs nothing it's very cheap and branded carnison beta alanine, which is a better form of beta alanine, is very expensive. So you need to look on the bottle and say, okay, where did this company get this beta alanine? What brand is it? Is it branded? Is it generic? All these things matter, okay? So I can't sit here and decipher every little thing that's gonna separate us from every other company. What I can tell you is this. Our brand is gonna be based on what works and there's not going to be any lying involved i will never ever tell you that this is going to do something it's not supposed to do okay so that's our main objective and that's what i think is going to help us grow in the industry is being real even at the sacrifice of some margin okay um Bodybuilding FPV says, if you combine fats with high glycemic carbs, do you think the fats get shuttled to adipose tissue or do the fats lessen the glycemic impact of the carbs? Um, I've always felt like fats lessen the impact of glycemic carbs. So if like, for example, if I eat white rice, it digests extremely quickly before my training. So I may be halfway through my workout and feel like I'm starting to crash a little bit like energy wise, like pump wise, I might not be getting what I want, what I want out of it because the food is gone. So if I add a little bit of fat, um, if I added a little bit of fat in the form of coconut oil, say for example, it will slow down the digestion of the rice just a little bit, but not so much that it's going to sit in my stomach forever, but more so that it's just, it's not shuttled through so quickly. So adding fats to carbs slows them down a little bit. Sometimes you want that. Sometimes you don't. Okay. It's not always the best idea before a workout to do that unless you know your body. Unless you know your body and you know that that fat digests well for you. I know for me, for co like coconut, for coconut oil, for example, will digest quickly. So I can do some coconut oil and rice. It will slow down the rice a little bit and it will allow me to have more energy throughout my workout. So I don't ever worry about combining fats with carbs. I don't think it's uh, as evil as everybody else thinks it is. It just depends on timing throughout your diet throughout the day. Sweet Morissette says, can you build a great chest without a fly movement? Uh, yeah, I believe so. 
I think if you just did, um, if you did flat bench, incline bench, and decline bench, and you just did those the best you could do them, and you kept with the progressive overload and kept going, getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and kept pushing the intensity of those exercises, there's no reason why you wouldn't have a massive chest. I do think doing all the movements and hitting a muscle from all angles is better. And I think it's going to result in a better look. But I think if we took somebody from day one and said, okay, you can't do any flies. All you can do is all the pressing movements. They would still have a phenomenal chest. Jacob four, two, three says after a huge weight loss period, when should I start bulking currently around 13 to 15% body fat? I've lost about a hundred pounds. I think, um, you should, once you get down to the desired weight, you, you are comfortable with, if you're at 13% body fat and that's what you're comfortable with and you feel like, you know, I've been, I've been dropping fat long enough. Then it's time to start. It's really your choice. At the end of the day, it comes down to it's your choice. Some people want to get all the way down to 6% body fat before they start bulking. Some people don't care if they're 25%, they want to keep bulking because bulking doesn't mean getting, I want to gain fat. Bulking means I want to, I'm working on putting on muscle. So there is no prerequisite to when you want to start putting on muscle. That's really just your choice. If you want to get shredded before putting on muscle, then I would wait. If you feel comfortable with the weight you're at now and you're like, okay, now I want to start putting on some muscle, then that's what I would do. If I was in your shoes, I would be bulking right now. I would be eating a bulking type diet. That doesn't mean bad food. It would be all very clean food, still chicken, rice, steak, oatmeal, you know, eggs, egg whites, all that stuff, potatoes, it would still be those foods, but it would be in a surplus amount of calories. And that's all I would do. I would do that and just, and and my body would gain muscle in the process. And in the, in the, in, in while that happened, I would look better and better and better regardless of my body fat levels, because I'm gaining more muscle. And then when I, when I am ready to shred at that point, the muscles, the the fat's going to come off even faster. So the answer to your question is you can bulk whenever you feel like it. The second part, it, the second part of the answer is if you're asking me what I would do, I would start bulking now. Sabe Stefan says, love your podcast. Can you give some more information about your cutting diet macros gear? Maybe uh, we don't talk about gear on this channel. Uh, I've talked about gear and stuff on my other personal channel, but Um, as far as diet and all that, this is what I'll say. If you want, honestly, the the full spectrum, go to my personal channel, Fuad Abiyad, uh, YouTube backslash Fuad Abiyad. I've I've been doing some vlogs lately with the whiteboard and there's a ton of information there on my, my current diet is actually up. I did a vlog about two weeks ago now where I started my new transformation diet and I, I charted the whole thing on a whiteboard in the video to show people uh, how I set up my macros, how I set up my diet, what the foods are, what they look like, how every single meal is set up. So if you want all that information, check out that video there. It'll give you the full rundown of what I'm doing right now. Giant, the giant ginger says currently in a growing phase have been in a calorie surplus for a while now, puffy, but not fat yet. My morning weight has leveled off the past two weeks. I know weight isn't the only factor to go off of, that being said, should I look to up my intake or can I stay put and build quality muscle? Okay. This is going to come down to your eye and how you look in the mirror. When I look in the mirror, if you tell me I'm puffy but not fat, I'm going to increase my food. Puffy to me says you can still see all your lines. You can see the separation in the muscle, but everything's kind of puffy. Like it's covered with a thin layer of fat. To me, that's okay. If I was stuck somewhere, I'd be like, okay, it's time to bump up the food a little bit. If you're fat, I know it says you're not fat, but if you really look and you feel like you're fat, if you feel like there's just too much fat and you know you can't see any outlines of any muscles or anything like that, then I wouldn't up the food. I would stay where you're at and just try and build into grow into that weight. Um, so those are your two scenarios, and that's kind of your answer. So if if like you said, you're puffy but not fat yet. I bump it up, bump it up 500 calories, see what happens, bump it up, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 20 grams of carbs per meal and see what happens. Cause sometimes you hit those plateaus and you kind of force your body through it. Daniel Boone 60 says, if you had to choose one, what would you put your carbs pre or post-workout? I like some of my best workouts after carbless pre-meals. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So Daniel's asking if you, if I had to put carbs somewhere, would I put them pre or post? Um, I'm assuming you're doing a low carb diet and that's why you're asking. So what I would say is this, the reason you feel good on carbless pre meals is because you're not digesting any food. A lot of people think their biggest meal has to be their pre-workout meal because they're going to train and that's actually the opposite. Okay. The smaller the meal, the better the workout it still has to have protein. I still think you should eat before training. I don't really agree with that, with fasted training, but it, it, my meals, my smallest meal of the day is my pre-workout meal. Okay. Now, if I had to eliminate carbs from one of them, I would eliminate from the pre meal. So I would go in with uh, carbs and maybe some vegetables, maybe a small amount of fat, it's a very small amount of fat. And I would go train and then I would have all those carbs post-workout because you probably have glycogen in your system from eating food beforehand. So you don't necessarily need the carbs as much before as you will after because you want to replenish all those glycogen stores from when you just trained. So if I had to choose one, definitely you're going to get more of an anabolic effect and recovery effect from putting the carbs post-workout. But in my full opinion, you should have them both. If I was going to eliminate carbs from my diet, it wouldn't be from around the workout. It would be all of my carbs. If I was going to center, if I was going to place my carbs one place in a diet, it would be pre, intra, and post. And for those of you who don't know, intra means during my workout. So pre-workout, I would have a small amount of carbs. Intra workout, I would have even smaller amount of carbs. So I'll give you guys some numbers. These numbers may not apply to you because obviously I'm a lot bigger than most of you, maybe the same size as some of you. I don't know, but um, pre meal, I probably do 50 grams of carbs. Okay, 50, 70 max. Intra workout, 25 grams of carbs. That's all I need. I don't do insulin. I don't do anything like that. So I don't need 100 grams of carbs during my workout. The hostile. Intra R3, which is our intra workout shake powder. I designed it with carbs in it. There's 25 grams of carbs in it. And this is exactly why this question is exactly why I have that. So, and then post workout would be 100 grams of carbs. Okay. So you're going to do this, right? A little bit of car moderate carbs, then a little bit during training. These are going to be really fast acting. And then you're going to go up and you're going to do a lot of carbs post-workout and that's going to refill your body. So that's how I would set it up. Now, if I wanted to, if I was on a super low carb diet and I didn't want to have any, it would be the other meals. So if this is meal three and then training, and this is meal four, meal one and two and meal five and six are going to be carbless. But all the, all the carbs are going to be, if I'm doing a super low carb diet, that's how I would set it up. Abraham Conqueso says, how do you get out of a gym rut? I don't feel like lifting. I feel like I've lost, I've lost on my goals and my progress. Um, Abraham, there, and we all go through gym ruts, okay? We all go through periods where even me, even guys at my level, we all go through periods where you're like, ah, you know, maybe I don't feel like training. Maybe I need to take some time off. This is the difference. You have to recognize first if it's physiological, because I do believe there's such a thing as overtraining. So I think if you overtrain, one of the one of the symptoms of overtraining that I've recognized is not wanting to go to the gym. It's funny, your body actually says to you, I don't feel like going. It's not because you don't feel like going, it's because you're probably overtrained. Some of you are lazy, yes. Some of you are working too hard and not smart enough and your bodies are breaking down and it's causing you to go into these peaks and valleys where you feel really good, then you're crashing and you need a break and you're feeling really good and you're crashing and you need a break. That could be one scenario. In that scenario, you take a couple of days off, you rest, you probably feel rejuvenated to get back at the gym, you get back and kick your own ass. Okay. The second scenario is you got lazy and you took a few days off and now you're like, I don't really feel like going back. Maybe it's not for you. You know, that's not the answer you want to hear. I know it's not the answer you want to hear, but maybe it's not for you. There are two scenarios in which people go to the gym, in my opinion. One, they want to look better. So they force themselves to go because they feel like training will make them look better because that's their goal. They want to look better. Two, they want to look better 
the person wants to look better, but they also love doing it. So the first person wants to look better, but they're doing it reluctantly and they're forcing themselves to go like, I got to do the cardio. I got to do this. I got to go work out because I got to lose such and such amount of weight. It's a reluctance to go. So it's easy to fall into a rut because as soon as you kind of don't go for a few days, you're like, hey, I don't want to do it anymore. But it's because you don't really love it and you don't really want to be there. So maybe it's not for you. Maybe you need to find a different way to lose weight um, or do something else to, you know, play a sport or something to lose weight. Maybe that's what you want to do. Okay. But if you do love it and you just, you know, you missed a few days and you need to get back then just get back, just get back. Just, there's nothing, there's no secret. There's no motivation. Okay. There's no, there's nothing I can say to you and there's no amount of videos you can watch that will keep you on track if you don't want to be on track. I promise you, okay? Because being on track in bodybuilding or in fitness or in, in, in changing your physique means a 24-7 effort. And I know that sounds really daunting, but it's not. It just means your eating has to be on point and your training has to be on point. So even if every day you watch a YouTube video, I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to go on and look at Ronnie Coleman's video and it motivates me. And now I'm going to go to the gym, right? You go to the gym, you're motivated, you kick ass, you get home. And then you're like, oh, I'm not motivated anymore. I don't feel like eating. I'm probably not going to eat right now. Or you know what? Maybe I, I don't really feel like eating a bodybuilding meal. I'm just going to, I'm going to throw a pizza pocket in the microwave and that's good enough. Because that's the motivation ends. Once the motivation wears off, it's only discipline left. If your discipline is lacking, then you get into a rut and you don't feel like going and then you don't go anymore because the motivation wore off. So you're like, I don't really feel like going because nobody's motivating me to go. My buddies aren't going. Uh, the videos on YouTube aren't working anymore. I don't really care how I look. If you really want to make a change and you like training, it's the discipline that will keep you going there. Okay. I have days where I don't want to go train and I look at myself and I go, well, this is what you do. This is what you want to do. And I'm not talking about for a living. Even if I wasn't getting paid for this, this is what I want to do. Even if I had a different job and I worked at the line on Chrysler or something like that at Chrysler and I was just a line worker, I don't care. I would still go to the gym because it's what I want to do. And even if I got tired and I didn't want to go or I missed a couple of days, I would be like, okay, you got to get your ass back in gear, get back to the gym. It's a discipline thing. It's not a motivation thing. You set your time, you set your watch every day and you're like, okay, this time I got to eat. This time I got to train. doesn't matter if I feel good. If I don't feel good, no one gives a shit. This is what I got to do if I want to look better. And that goes for the person that's reluctant to do it. And it goes for the person that loves to do it. Because even the person that loves to do it is going to have days where he doesn't, days where he or she doesn't love it. And they're like, you got to dig from somewhere else to make it happen. Okay. And that's not, it doesn't come from some fairy tale place. It just, it's in you. And that's your discipline and it's your heart and it's your drive and it's your passion. So if you don't want to go because you don't like it, don't fucking go. But if you want to go and you're just being a lazy ass, then you need to look deep inside and find the heart and the passion and the desire and go, this is discipline. This is my daily activity. Whether I want to go or not is not a fucking question anymore. This is just going to happen. And then you start going. And it doesn't feel good to start over, but you have to start over now. So now you're at day one. Just start crossing them off a calendar, day one, day two, day three. Before you know it, you're a year in, your physique looks better, and you will owe it all to your own discipline. That's really all I could say about, you know, gym ruts are normal. Gym ruts happen to everybody, but the discipline will pull you out of them. Martin Feely says, do you prefer high volume, lower weight, or the opposite for arms? I prefer moderate weight with a lots of focus and a little bit higher volume for arms. So I don't necessarily mean higher volume sets. I think 9 to 12 sets is probably all you need for arms. And those aren't all working sets. You're only doing, you know, one or two working sets per exercise. So I would say you're going to do six working sets total for arms, maybe. You know, you're like two for each exercise 
So you might do six to eight working sets. Uh, so volume as far as sets go is low, but volume for repetitions is a little bit higher. I like 10 to 15 uh, for arms. I don't really do stuff in the six range or four range. I just feel like I get a lot of 10 to, and this isn't because I'm older. This is like, you know, this is how I've always felt. I made my best gains ever on my arms when I was in the 12 to 15, 10 to 12 range. Anywhere below that, all I got was tendon pain in my tricep, tendon like in my elbows, or my bicep tendon just like right here in the crease of your arm. I feel like arms, because they're a small muscle, they don't need heavy, heavy, heavy pounding. They just need a lot of focus and really good form and a little bit higher rep range. And, and that's kind of my philosophy on arms. I don't think you can train a bicep and tricep the same way you train back or the same way you train legs or the same way. It's a little different. Small muscle group doesn't take uh, the same amount of effort as far as weight goes. Time is muscle says, getting enough sleep is always a problem when prepping for a show, especially in the final three to four weeks. Do you have any tips or sleep aids that you, that you have tried in the past that may be useful? Um, I gotta be honest with you. Not really. You can use melatonin. Melatonin is an option. Some people go up to like six grams, which is a little higher, but, uh, I, I, you can use melatonin, but for me, that always helped me get to sleep, but it wouldn't help me stay asleep. And if you're dieting really, really hard and your body is in starvation mode, it's going to be hard to sleep. Like whenever I diet for a show, you know, I, I get four hours a night and it, even that it's choppy. It's like an hour. Then I wake up to pee and I can't go back to sleep because I'm starving. Then I'll get another hour eventually. Then I wake up again to go to the bathroom. It's like, and finally, after like four hours, I wake up and there's just no way I'm going to fall back asleep. And it's because I'm starving and my brain is racing and I have way more energy than I normally would have if I was eating a, a lot more food. And, um, it's just one of the downfalls of dieting. I don't really believe in taking a lot of pills like for sleep aids and stuff like that. It can be addictive. And so I never did that. I just kind of dealt with it. I, I just kind of dealt with it. It's just part of being hungry. It's part of a diet. I would get up finally after four hours and I would, you know, find my way to the gym and do some cardio so I could get my breakfast in. And that, that's kind of all I did. It's just part of who we are and what we do. In a push-pull workout routine, where is shoulders placed? Thomas Foley, 2019, asks. Um, shoulders most likely is going to be, well, you can kind of separate it this way. I would do shoulders on my push day, um, especially because you be, you're going to be doing military pressing and stuff like that, which is going to involve your chest. It's going to involve your triceps. It's definitely a push movement. And you're going to do some side laterals uh, or some lateral, sorry, some lateral raises uh, or some side raises, if you want to call them that. Um, you might do some front delts as well. And then I would save my rear delt work, like any uh, reverse pec deck or any bent over laterals or anything like that, or bent over raises, anything like that, I would save for back day or for my pulling, I guess you call it your pulling day. That's how I would split it up. I don't know if that's how everybody, everybody splits it up, but I would set the bulk of my shoulder routine on my pressing on my push day, and then I would do my rear delts on my pull day because your rear delts are going to be targeted more on your pull day. Matt Bright 10 says, who do you think is the best actor who was previously a bodybuilder? That has to be Arnold. The guy's a box office phenom. So I don't think, uh, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody's ever going to beat Arnold's records that was a bodybuilder. I don't, I mean, unless you count The Rock as being a bodybuilder, but I consider The Rock a, a wrestler. So if we're talking like a real bodybuilder, nobody's ever going to top Arnold in the box office. Jeremy, sir, both you and Luke talk about getting quite fat during bulk periods, off-season periods when you were young. Would you do anything different if you could go back or is it a good way to get big? Thanks. I wouldn't do anything any different. I think eating, eating big is what got me big. I think eating a ton of food. I mean, when you listen to Luke, he's eating like he's in his the prime of his career right now. He's eating in the off season, he's eating his meal, and then he's eating some hot dogs afterwards. That's kind of what I did. And when I was in the prime of my career, and I was doing my best building, 
I would eat, I had a solid meal plan that was probably three, I'd say 35 to 4,500 calories. And I would eat stuff on top of that. You know, I throw in a cookie, I throw in an extra sandwich, I throw in whatever I want. I was hungry. If I was hungry, I ate, but I always got my meals in and I would eat on top of that. And I think that is the best way to grow. And I wouldn't change anything about anything I did to get where I am because I think I grew at a pretty fast rate um, in relation to what my genetics will allow. Because so I was putting on about 10 pounds of muscle a year and 10 pounds in a, in a year is actually quite a bit of muscle to add like actual muscle tissue. So I, I wouldn't trade that. Uh, I think that's the way to go. Uh, Phil Killerin says, should you cycle a non-stim pre-workout? No, I don't think you have to, especially if it's, if, if the ingredients are right. Like we have two ingredients in our product that are not adaptable. You, your body does not adapt to them. You don't have to take more as you go or anything like that. They do your body. Every time you take it, your body thinks it's the first time it took it. And uh, there is no reason you should have to cycle your non-stim pre-workout because the only reason you would cycle any pre-workout is just because maybe you want to go off caffeine for a little while so you can get the benefit from it again or something like that. Uh, if you're using a non-stim, I don't know any ingredients out there that are, I'd have to see the pre-work, I'd have to see the pre-workout itself, but I don't know any ingredients out there that are going to hurt you if you take them on a continuous basis that they're putting in non-stim pre-workouts. Man of Words 108 says, does a meniscus tear mean the end of a bodybuilding career? Um, no, it doesn't. I don't know exactly what it means. I mean, I know what a meniscus tear is, but I don't, I mean, I don't know what it means exactly for your bodybuilding career. I know guys have gone through everything, including myself, torn muscles, torn ligaments, torn, you know, this and that. And there's always a way back whether it be stem cells or PRP or full blown surgery and then repair and then getting back after that. Um, there's always kind of a way you just kind of have to figure it out, but I, I wouldn't, there was a period of my career where I would say that's career ending. If I, Oh, if this happens to me, that's career ending. Or if that happens to me, it's career. And so many things have happened to me that haven't been career ending. I've kind of decided that there really isn't, will it make life a lot harder? if you have to have surgery um, to repair your meniscus or, or if it hurts and it's not repairable hundred percent, is it going to make life harder? Yes, it definitely is, but it doesn't mean you can't be a bodybuilder or can't lift weights. Eagle Lauren one says, how much of my protein intake can I be getting through protein powder? If I'm aiming for one and a half grams per pound of body weight and getting it from food, does it matter a lot? Um, yes, it does and doesn't. So I think eat, having protein powder is good and essential, especially if you're eating 1.5 grams per pound, because a lot of people have trouble getting in that amount of protein because it seems like a lot to eat. I want to say first that if you can eat it through whole food, chicken, um, you know, chicken, steak, fish, whatever protein you like, I think it's probably better, but I think there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with one of those meals every day being a shake or even two. I think if you start going past two, you start to see negative effects. I think one shake, you don't see any difference. I think if you have one, if you have six meals and one of them is a shake, I don't know if you're going to see any difference in your growth as a bodybuilder in a negative way. I mean, if you do two, maybe you see something. Maybe you don't feel the same in the gym. Maybe it's a little different. I'm not sure. I did two for a really long time. It felt great. Everyone's different though. If you start doing three, I think you're going to start to see a difference. You start to see things aren't going to grow the same. Maybe your performance in the gym is not the same. Maybe the muscle just doesn't look the same. I don't agree with too many supplements. I think when it comes to protein powder, one shake is definitely okay. Two shakes is okay. Maybe. Three shakes, I think you've gone a little far. Only in extreme situations would I do three shakes. Rob Doozy 72 says, if you could train with anyone living or dead, who's your pick to learn from? Uh, 
I'd like to train with Lee Haney or Branch Warren. It's so opposite. It's crazy. I felt like Lee Haney was really smart. And I never got to hear enough of Lee Haney because Lee Haney was kind of before the internet. And I really wasn't following bodybuilding at that time at all. I didn't start following bodybuilding until well, well after that. I think it was like the year 2000 or 98, 99, something like that. But when I have heard him speak in interviews and have heard him answer questions and things like that, I think he's very, very smart. So I'd like to go through a training session and learn his philosophies on stuff. But at the same time, there is a crazy person inside me that wants to train with Branch Warren. And I almost had the opportunity and it fell through because I couldn't make it across the border. Um, but uh, I'd like to see, it's just a challenge. I feel like I train pretty hard. I feel like I train pretty intense. I'd like to see if I can handle a training session with Branch Warren. Cause I feel like he destroys everybody he works out with. So I just want to know if I can hang really. It's just a challenge of my own. This is a challenge to myself because Branch Warren's kind of that measuring stick for hard work. So yeah, those two guys are probably the two guys I'd like to try. BLB85 says, what are the most overrated subs on the market? Well, it's a tough question to answer, honestly. I would say there isn't really anything I can answer with that because it depends on your goals. See, the, my first inclination is to say something like glutamine. Okay, glutamine, I feel like is a waste. I don't really need to add it to anything. But then I think to myself, glutamine is very good at restoring stomach lining and it's good for your digestive system. So I'm like, okay, if that's your goal, then it's a great supplement, right? So it almost, I just, I, I have trouble saying like this supplement or that supplement is overrated because they all have a purpose depending on the person's goal, right? So if your goal is to heal your stomach lining, then glutamine is going to be your best friend and, you know, pre-workouts or not. So it just really depends on what your goal is. I can't, I have trouble saying what's overrated, what's not. As far as bodybuilding is concerned, I can't say any supplement is overrated. And it's not because I own a supplement company. It's because I feel like they all have their place. Like whether it be greens or pre-workout or intra-workout or protein powder or fish oils, vitamins and minerals, um, you know, nootropics, all the different supplements, all the creatine, glutamine, all the different, I feel like they all have their place. I feel like all of them have their place and all of them belong in a program somewhere. So it's not really anything that's overrated. It really just depends on what your goals are and how your eating is. Let's say you eat tons of vegetables every day. You get vegetables in every serving, you're getting fruit in every serving, then a greens product would be useless for you. You'd be just wasting your money because you're getting all the greens you need from your food. So I could say, well, in that case, greens would be overrated and you wouldn't need them. Let's say you eat tons of fish, steak, eggs, and you don't need protein powder. It's going to be overrated. You're like, I eat tons of stuff from food. I get everything I need from food. I don't need any protein powder. So it's hard to pinpoint one thing. It really depends on the person, what their diet's like, what they need as, and what their goals are. Jacked SE says, why eat low fat protein and add fats like avocados instead of just eating like chicken thighs? Okay, so chicken thighs are primarily saturated fat. Saturated fat's not bad, but it's not the only fat and eating too much saturated fat can end up being bad. So instead of eating, what I wanna do is I wanna get as much healthy nutrients as I can. So I will eat some red meat every day if I eat one steak a day, that will give me some saturated fat. To me, that's enough saturated fat. I don't need to add tons of saturated fats. Uh, on a normal bodybuilding diet, this I'm saying if you're getting like carbs in and everything, not just like on a keto diet. So if you're on a normal diet, the saturated fat I'm going to get from like one steak a day is good enough for saturated fat. But I need some, I need some non-saturated fats because those are the ones that are going to lower my LDL levels, increase HDL levels, they're going to help fight inflammation. They're going to really, it's going to help my body perform better overall. And I want to increase fat because I don't think keeping low fats all the time is great for bodybuilding. But I don't want to increase fats only from saturated fat because now I'm going to, I'm going to run into issues if I have too much saturated fat. 
So the, the best thing to do is increase fats from your healthier sources, like avocados, like peanut butter, like coconut oil, all these, and even, I know coconut oil is half saturated, but it's the other half is not, it's a medium chain. So adding those fats, well, like I said, will help fight inflammation, will help with heart disease, will help lower LDL, will help increase your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. And these are the reasons why we want to increase those fats because we can't just increase all our saturated fat and then hope that we're going to be healthy. It just doesn't work that way. So a little bit of saturated fat is good in my opinion. Fats overall are good for your bodybuilding program to help grow. I made some of the best gains in my career with high, like a higher fat diet, but it was higher in healthy fats like uh, salmon or fish oils or, you know, omega threes and omega sixes, just things like that. It wasn't loaded with saturated fats. So that's the difference. We're talking about two different types of fat, one being okay for you, but not in massive amounts, in my opinion, and the other being okay for you because it's going to help your body perform better and fight inflammation and things like that. So this is why we're adding the different types of fat instead of just eating all chicken thighs. Lucas V Gaines says, vegan diet and bodybuilding. Why do you think switching from meat to plant-based proteins would have any impact on the look of a physique? I hear this said a lot. Curious because what are your thoughts? Being a vegan since before bodybuilding yet, I've had no issues adding tissue, maintaining a hard look, or even getting into contest prep shape. I don't have any issues with the vegan diet. My only... My only factor that I point to over and over again is studies that show that you're not going to get the amount of aminos gram per gram. So a gram of like, let's say pea protein uh, versus a gram. First of all, pea, pea protein is not even complete, but if you took a complete protein, um, let's say like quinoa, right? as a complete protein. So you take quinoa and you take a gram of quinoa and you take a gram of steak and the aminos, the aminos in the gram of protein from the quinoa is not going to be equal to the aminos in the gram of protein from the steak in the levels. They won't be equal and the absorption rate, they won't be equal. So this is what worries me. I'm like, when we're talking about being, if you're talking about just being in shape, if you're talking about just looking good for the beach, if you're talking about, even looking good for the stage, but not being massive, then you can get away with saying, I don't need to get every single lick drop of aminos. I can just, this is good enough. I don't think you can build an open class bodybuilding physique on a vegan diet. I just don't think you can get the right amount of aminos. I don't think you can do it without getting a ton of carbs that go with it. And I don't think even if you can get the right amount of aminos, if the absorption rate would be the same uh, from the vegan diet compared to the uh, meat diet. And that's just from studies I've seen. I'm sure there's studies that show the opposite. But if I just point to real world, the real world, I look at bodybuilders, I don't know any vegans that are the size of open class bodybuilders. That's just anecdotal. It doesn't mean it can't be done. I've just yet to see it. I've seen some men's, men's physique guys that look phenomenal. I've seen some, I haven't even seen a classic guy. Looks amazing. I had, I had AJ Ellison on my podcast. He was, he, you know, he's a classic guy. He turned pro in classic and men's physique. Beautiful physique, hard as nails. Um, but in his own admission, he ate meat for most of his life. And he only turned vegan about, a year ago, less maybe. And he also admittedly said that he is genetically predisposed to being leaner. So if he wasn't, would that diet be working for him? I don't know. You know what I mean? And if he had been a vegan all his life, would he have put on that amount of muscle? I also don't know. So these are all questions that nobody's answered for me. So until I see some answers, in real life, I don't know if I can buy that not eating meat will get you to be the, an open class bodybuilder to the size of an open class bodybuilder. I just don't know if that will happen. 
am from am says how long do you usually prep for a show and what is your cardio regime like in prep uh, i usually prep for shows for 12 weeks my cardio usually ramps up from 30 minutes a day all the way up to two 45 minute sessions so we'll start with like 30 minutes in the morning on empty stomach and i'll do that until you know for a couple of weeks and then we'll start to bump things up we'll go 35 40 45 minutes and then the morning session usually won't go past 40 or 50, 45 or 50 minutes. If we need to add a second session in, we'll add it later in the day, maybe before my last meal. We'll add in a second session. And the second session will start at 30. So it'll be like 45 and 30. Then it'll be 45 and 35, 45 and 45. And we'll keep bumping things up that way. And the most I've ever done is two 55-minute sessions. So that's kind of how cardio is set up. Usually... At this size I am now, one session in the morning for 45 minutes and then maybe 10 or 20 minutes after my, car, after my training is usually enough to get me in shape. Connor Ogden says, do you need a carb or fat source with a protein shake or is all protein still used by the muscle and the body? I never drink a protein shake by itself. I just think it would go right through me. I don't think if I'm drinking, I mean, unless you're drinking casein, but either that, either, either way, I don't, unless I'm getting ready for a contest and I'm trying to like kind of bare bones it, I never, ever eat protein by itself, whether it be a chicken breast or whether it be a shake or whether it be, any, it won't, even if I'm prepping for a show, I'll do chicken and broccoli. You know, that's the closest I'll get to just protein. Um, but most of the time, even if I'm in a contest diet, it'll be chicken and a source of fat or chicken and a carb. And I do think it's because your body will end up using that protein for energy and you don't want that. So in a contest diet, you kind of play with that a little bit and you're a little bit more okay with your body using protein for energy because you're trying to like dwindle down this body you have and get rid of all the fat. So you're okay with it sometimes. But if this is a lifestyle choice and you're trying to maintain your muscle mass, trying to gain muscle even, uh, I don't think it's beneficial to do protein by itself because your body's not going to use it for where it, what it needs. I need, I need my protein that I ingest to work for my muscle. I need it to build muscle that I've broken down. So if I'm just eating protein by itself, my body's going to start to break down that protein for energy. Right. And that's not what I want. So having another source with it will allow your body to use the protein more to build muscle instead of just, you know, using it for energy for your daily energy sources or your daily energy purposes. I'm going to answer this question because I like the name. The acceptable asshole says recently got a Theragun. I know it's not a replacement for deep tissue massage, but how would you utilize it for pre-workout blood flow or post-workout recovery? So pre-workout, I hit it lightly for 10 minutes before I get in the car to go to the gym, or if I bring it with me to the gym, let's say I'm doing chest, right? I'll just hit my chest 10 minutes beforehand, uh, both sides, obviously, and not heavy, not pressing really hard. I'm not trying to traumatize the muscle. I'm just trying to get blood flow to it, okay? Then I'll start. That'll help loosen things up. Post-workout might be a little deeper, okay? I'm pushing a little harder, get things in there, really grind it out, maybe 20 minutes. Tops half an hour, but 20 minutes is probably enough. And that's kind of the way I use my Theragun. Now, if I have a knot or something, or if I have some type of injury, I'm going to go at it for a little while and try and work around it, work all the muscles around it, kind of get blood flowing to the area. But those are the two or three different scenarios in which I would use my Theragun. The pre, the pre use of it though is very light. It's just a little bit to draw blood to the area. I'm not doing anything really hard. Xavier G1313, is it better to cut longer and easier or faster and more harsh? I know this is probably a goal dependent, but would you recommend to the average person? The best way to cut fat is longer and slower, okay? Because longer is going to allow you to eat more food. Eating more food is going to allow you to retain more muscle. Retaining more muscle is always going to end up being the better result in the way you look and your progress overall. So. If you know you want to be shredded for summer, don't wait until 
May 21st and then go, okay, I got a month and then start hammering, you know, drop all your carbs and start doing two hours of cardio. That's not the way to do it. Okay. That is the number one way I get people coming to me going, I'm overtrained or I, I feel like shit. I don't want to be in the gym anymore because they're overtrained or I lost a bunch of weight and I'm really weak and I look like shit. And I don't know why I look like I'm skinny fat because they're trying to rush through a diet. So in my opinion, if you want to get ready for summer, excuse me, sorry guys, my nose is itchy. You want to get ready for summer. You got to start three months before four months before. And cut down your calories really slow so that your body can adapt and not just dump a bunch of muscle trying to like keep up. So it's always going to be longer and slower is the way to go. MCARPS48 says, for building muscle, is it best to do all sets as pyramid sets or would adding some straight sets be okay as well? I don't think it's wrong to do straight sets. It's just not something that I'm going to do regularly because it seems weird, right? So if I'm doing arms, I might do straight sets because I'm not worried about going heavy when I train arms. But when I'm training any other body part, I usually like weight is usually a factor. So for example, if I'm doing chest and I do, let's say I start with flat bench or I start, start with incline bench and then I go to flat bench, I'm not going to sit down on a flat bench or lay down on a flat bench and put 315 on the bar for my first, first set all the way through my third set. It's not going to happen. I'm going to start off because it's, I don't want to start with my heaviest weight. I'm going to end up getting hurt. And the same thing goes if I go from incline bench press to dumbbell, I'm not going to go right to 150 pound dumbbells. I'm going to go to eighties, then one tens, then one thirties and one fifties, something like that. Right? So wherever it's weight dependent, wherever the exercise is weight dependent, which is most of them for me anyway, other than arms, arms is usually not weight dependent, but other than arms if or shoulders maybe, if it's weight dependent, there's always going to be a pyramid of weight. I'm always going to go feeder set, warm-up set, feeder set, working set, failure set. It's always going to look like that, okay? Or it'll be three. It'll be a feeder, working, and failure. It'll be something like that. I'm never, ever going to go in and just go, okay, failure, failure, failure. It's never going to look like that. So... I can see doing straight sets for shoulders, say, if you did like military press and then you went over and did lateral raises, you could grab like 30 or 40 pound dumbbells to start and just knock them out for eight to 10. You do three or four sets of eight to 10. I could see that happening. So there is some scenarios where I could see it, but most of the time, even in those cases, for me, I always have a pyramid structure of some sort. I just don't ever like I always like to finish with my heaviest, most intense set. So I want to add more weight. And I never want to start like that. I want to start out feeling something out and then kind of going from there. I'll answer one more. Um, John Engman says, my knees are fucked up. Feels like I can't train my legs without fucking up my knees and hips, walking around like an old man for days trying to find exercises that don't hurt, but squats, extensions, leg press and hacks, lifts, hurts like a bitch. Thanks, man. Great podcast. Okay. So there's a couple things you can do. The first thing to do and the easiest thing to do is go get an ultrasound. Uh, go see your doctor, get an ultrasound requisition, go get an ultrasound and take a look. Do you have any tears? You want to know if you have any tears? Do I have any tears in the patella, which is below the knee? Do I have any tears in the quad tendon, which is above the knee? Do I have any tears in the knee? You know, my meniscus, anything like that is, am I, do I have any tears to deal with? If you have tears, any tearing anywhere in your knees, you're going to want to do like a PRP shot or a stem cell or something that's going to help recover the tendon. Okay. Take some time off, let that stuff work. If all that doesn't apply, you don't have any tears, you know, you don't have any tears. It's just inflammation. I would say take a couple of weeks off of, of training legs, let your knees heal in the process of taking the time off, do a lot of therapy. And that means see a couple therapists, see a therapist once or twice a week, three times a week. If you can, that's number one, a lot of ice baths. I would do an ice bath every other day. It doesn't have to be your whole body, just your lower body, just so your knees and your hips and everything get in. Um, this is something I did for a long time. It helped me dramatically. Okay. Do ice baths every other day for a couple of weeks that will dramatically reduce the inflammation. 
And then I would start doing heat as well. When you're not doing an ice bath, I would do some Tiger Balm on the knees, on the tendons, all around. Wrap it with a tensor so it's, but not super tight, but just so it's compressed. And let that heat kind of keep the, what you're trying to do is reduce inflammation and bring as much blood flow to the area as possible. That will help bring nutrients, which will help heal the area. And if your tendons are really, really inflamed, they probably need a little bit of a break. So while you're taking that break, I would do all of these therapies. Then when you get back to it, you have to keep doing the therapies. Okay. That's the only way to keep your tendons healthy. That's my number one. Now, the third thing you do is get a lot of massage work because sometimes, when the muscle starts to grow too much in the leg, it'll start to pull on the tendon and it'll make you make your knee track in a different way. And that could cause a lot of knee pain. So you have to make sure your muscles are loose so that the tendons aren't being pulled on the, on the joint. So, cause if you don't know the muscle, the muscle attaches to the tendon, the tendon attaches to the bone, right? So if this muscle is growing at a rapid rate, it's going to start to pull on this tendon and the bone is not going to track properly. So the knee, the joint is not going to track properly if the tendon is pulling it one way or another. So the, if the muscles are loose, this pulling won't occur. It'll remain fluid. So massage, foam rolling, uh, a massage gun where you just kind of do it over your own legs. Uh, these are all very beneficial. Stretching, these things are all very, very beneficial to keeping the muscle loose, which keep the tendon loose, which will allow the bone to track properly, the joint to track properly. So there's a whole bunch of different therapies you can do there. If you add them all in with a couple weeks off in the gym, like for resting from training legs, your knees will feel better. So you just have to kind of give that time and a lot of, it takes a lot of effort. Nobody wants to sit in an ice bath for 10 minutes. You have to set your watch. I used to set my phone for 10 minutes and I'd put on like some Ozzy Osbourne and I'd sit in there and just like fucking go crazy in my head trying to deal with the pain. But after like three minutes, your legs go numb and it actually feels really good afterwards. So, um, yeah, doing an ice bath is not fun. Finding a therapist to massage you is not fun. Foam rolling is not fun. None of these things are fun, but, um, they work. And, uh, and that's, if you want your knees to feel better, those, that's what you got to do. Appreciate you guys watching. Please subscribe to the channel, like and share, and check out our pre orders in two weeks. We're excited to get the brand out. We're excited for everybody to try it. It's going to be a little while before it gets to you. It's still about a month, another month before we ship, but it's only a couple of weeks for pre orders. And um, yeah, I'm mean, really excited to see what you guys think. So, anyway, thanks you guys for watching. And until next time, train hard, stay focused. We'll be back soon.